Well, I would like to welcome everybody. Uh, we do have some folks here in the building as well as a number of people online. I wanna welcome you all to our History Sandwiched In. My name is Ann Daly and I am the Director of Education here. And today I'm also our presenter. So I'm gonna keep our ads short uh, because I was focused on the presentation, but we have a lot going on this fall through December. Um, we have our candlelight tour of Rose Hill this coming Saturday evening. If you're interested in that or any other program, do take a look at our calendar of events at historicgeneva.org. We have a program next week on uh, wireless innovation, and that'll be next Wednesday evening, both virtual and live. And then we have a virtual only program on the 18th of November about the Wharton Brothers Studio, which was a silent movie studio in Ithaca, New York. So I welcome you to check out our calendar and look at doing some of those programs with us. But for today, this is our sort of informal history program and the staff here do most of them. And today I'm gonna to talk about the family that lived in the building that I'm currently in, the Proudy Two House on South Main Street in Geneva. And I'm gonna just uh, start with our PowerPoint. We do have a little bit of a strange setup with PowerPoint today. For those of you on Zoom, you might see some icons that aren't normally there. That's due to technical difficulties, but hopefully you can all hear and see uh, what I'm showing. So I have here on our title screen a picture of the building that those of you who have been here before know as the Proudy Chu House, the Proudy Chu Museum, the Geneva Historical Society. We are now called Historic Geneva and we operate out of this building, but for many years, it was the home of the Proudy family. And we know a lot from the building itself, but also by, we are fortunate enough to have a lot of archival material. This is why archives are so important. So consider carefully before you throw things out, whether or not it's something that would be useful at an archive. We are fortunate to have not only the uh, building, but diaries from certain years that the Proudy family lived here of two members, as well as a photograph album. And that has given us some great visual material. Otherwise, this would be really hard to watch on Zoom. So these are just a couple samples. I have here a 1859 diary page that Phineas Proudy Jr. wrote. This is an 18, I think 50 or 60 uh, entry from Adelaide, his wife. And then this is also Adelaide's diary, but it's many years later in the 1880s. She becomes much more abbreviated in her descriptions of the family and their experiences. I guess this is the difference between being a 20 something year old new mother and being a 40 or 50 or something uh, woman who's had five children and a lot of experiences. She has uh, just a few words to write at that point. Uh, we, this is a page from the scrapbook that we have. It belonged to one of their daughters and it's a fantastic resource. It would be more fantastic if she had labeled all the photographs. She did not. So there is some guesswork involved in reading that. And we do also have a collection of letters from uh, for the Chu family who were connected as you'll see to the Proudies. So a lot of material and I've gone through much of it, but there's probably a lot more that could be done with some of this. So I will do my best with what I know based on this material. So our first Proudy is Phineas Proudy Sr. This is the only photograph we have of him. It is from the scrapbook that we have. He was born in 1788. Uh, I believe he's actually born in New Hampshire, but then grew up in Vermont where our star is here. Uh, as a young man, like so many others in the very early years of the Republic, he decided to move west. He actually followed his brother, John, uh, this is John Prouty, who moved to Schenectady, which in the early 1800s was frontier, as was this area. And his brother had a hardware store in Schenectady, and Phineas Prouty Sr. seems to have worked with that uh, hardware store, worked for his brother, or done some work in, in some regard there, but was also thinking about his own future. He did uh, end up eventually moving to Geneva, as we'll see. So we have that spot here, and he continued just to that point moving west. He served in the War of 1812. Uh, there's a number of resources. There are several genealogies of the Chu, the Hill House, and the Proudy family, and their descendants often say things that I needed to verify. Some things I was able to verify, some I weren't. A uh, descendant did say that Phineas Prouty Sr. served in the War of 1812. I did find evidence from the National Archives that he served, but I couldn't get much else. The genealogy said he was in Elisha Taylor's horse artillery, of which I could find no record on the internet. Now, if I did a deeper dive into War, um, War of 1812 records, perhaps I would have found more. 
The descendant also said that he received land grants for his service, but again, I could not confirm that anywhere, even that militia members in New York received land grants. So that's something that might need further research uh, to determine, but that may be where he got some of his uh, seed funding essentially for moving west. When he moved to Geneva, um, after sometime after his service, he decided to come from Schenectady and according to his descendant, who was very enamored of her ancestors, he had seen the possibilities of Western New York as a place for distributing goods and getting them back to market. Um, I don't know if he had all of that in mind, but that is what his uh, descendant, I believe it's Margaret Hillhouse, said about him. But he first started here in Geneva with a copper tin and sheet factory uh, where he was producing metal goods, which were certainly in high demand in 1815 when it's advertised here in the newspaper. And uh, because farming, they would have needed plows and buckets and tools of all sorts. So it was a good idea. And of course he had his brother as a source for goods and contacts within that uh, area. He had to, again, according to Margaret Hillhouse, have to carry everything overland. So he would have had to portage it quite a bit because this is 1815 before the canal was built. And so uh, he was successful in bringing things here. He eventually decided to do more importing, not so much just a factory, but added a lot more already manufactured goods to his stock and started advertising himself as having a hardware store. It was on Seneca Street and it's the build, it was in the spot that is today the building, uh, sometimes called the Prouty Building because that's how it was constructed as we'll get to at the end. Um, but it is now used for Hobart and Winsmith offices in downtown Geneva. And you can see this is a, a section from deeds. We're fortunate that most of the counties hereabouts are recorded in familysearch.org. So I was able to pin down a lot of the deeds without having to run around to courthouses that I did not really have time for. This shows just a section of the deed recordings under Phineas Prouty's name. All of these yellow lines are parcels of land that he purchased. And we can see right here in 1819 is the first one recorded for Ontario County. And that is a, um, he actually got it for a dollar, which I'm quite curious if uh, at some point I can talk to someone who knows more about deeds and land transactions. It was a sheriff's auction. Did no one else want the property? I'm curious as to how he managed to get it for just a dollar because it was a piece of property on Seneca Street which was not the hub of business in uh, 1819 that it became once the canal opened because a lot of the commercial area as those in Geneva will know was still around the Pulteney Park area. And he decided to connect a little closer to the lake perhaps because he's carrying in all that heavy iron <laughs> and copper equipment. Um, he did a lot of other transactions. So this building here, this is a picture of the hardware building on Seneca Street. This picture is long after the time that he had his hardware store there. In fact, it's probably from after his death, but it's the same building and it does give you an idea of, it stayed a hardware store for many years. It was at, um, today I think it's 20 Seneca Street. I have 24 down here. It, it covered several addresses. So the address changes over time. I think he originally had 10 to 12 Seneca Street. And it was the first of many, many land purchases. This is a small segment of what was listed for him in Ontario County. His name is listed for Seneca and Yates. Um, I didn't go through all of them to see which were him and which were his son, but suffice it to say, he had a lot of property, not only in this state, but other states as well. So he started out with, with a great deal of property to make himself successful. He, of course, the next thing he had to do after he bought his property was get married. And he had met a woman, uh, presumably while he lived in Schenectady, Margaret Matilda Van Franken, and they were married September 19th of 1819. They had ultimately four children, Nicholas, Harriet, Sarah Augusta, who was called Gussie, and Phineas Jr. And they were born about two years apart. Nicholas sadly died uh, prior to the birth of any of his siblings of apparently dysentery. And... Uh, they had the three other children. Mrs. Prouty was descended from Dutch settlers in uh, the Hudson Valley. And again, according to Margaret Hillhouse, she brought a number of Dutch traditions into the family, including cookies, which were not commonly made in the early 1800s in baking traditions in um, New England uh, families, which is where the Prouty, Mr. Prouty came from. So she brought the cookie tradition to the family. 
Now, uh, this is a map that shows that Seneca Street property here. Uh, this is from much later in the 1800s. Um, I think it's the 1867 or maybe the 1884 uh, Sandburn map that shows buildings downtown. And you can see the hardware store here and property behind it. Again, all of these land transactions involve pieces of this property. And he started with this central spot here, but he was able to take ownership of a lot of the land around it. And in fact, the building, all of this became his property. And he had the hardware store here, but he rented out the other storefronts to other businesses. And you can see a view of it here. This is uh, looking west up towards, this is where the uh, Methodist church is today. The hardware store is over here. And this is looking um, east. And you can see, I believe this is the Linden block here. And the other buildings, most of which are not there anymore, but some of which are, I believe this one still is. So you get a sense of what the community looked like while they were probably mid-century. These, um, I think, don't have an exact date on this photograph, but I'd say 1870s, perhaps. Um, so we still have the dirt streets, which weren't changed until the 1890s. And of course, all the horses and carriages and such. So in these early years that they lived in Geneva, they actually lived over the store from everything I've been able to determine. Um, they, I assume these rooms up here somewhere and maybe expanded over when he purchased the additional property. Unfortunately for the family, uh, mom, Margaret, died very suddenly uh, in 1830 with uh, three small children, apparently again of dysentery. So the water around here must not have been too good to drink. Um, according to the newspaper at any rate. Uh, Phineas never remarried. And I have to admit, after reading through some of the genealogy, I wonder if it's not because I found that his mother also died when he was very young and his father remarried. And they subsequently had several more children, something like five, six, seven, I can't remember how many. Um, did that make him not want to remarry? That's complete speculation on my part, but it did make me wonder because many men did remarry if they lost their wife at such a young age. However, he did have a handy sister-in-law. His brother in Schenectady died uh, not too long after Prouty came here to Geneva. And the wife of that John Prouty and her son, also named John Prouty, came here to Geneva. Their son was already an adult. So he and his mother moved to Geneva and she, Clarissa Prouty, helped care apparently for the young Prouty children after um, Margaret Van Franken Prouty's death. Well, they didn't want to live over the store at Seneca Street with all those horses and manure in the street outside for very long. So they, uh, Phineas Prouty Sr. decided to build a house and he wanted it in the country. Evidently was not bothered with having a bit of a drive into work uh, because he built a house that was called Maple Hill. Uh, later, many of you may know of it as the Lafayette Inn, which it was until it burned down in the 20th century. And it I believe is this house here. This is Washington Street Cemetery. That's Washington Street heading up towards preemption. And I think it is this building that shows here. And you can see if you have to take a wagon or a buggy, this is not around the corner from downtown, but it's not unfeasible if you do have access to transportation, such as a horse and buggy, which they would have. So they decided to move out there. He built the house. It was in the Greek revival style. Um, however, they didn't stay there forever, as we'll see shortly. Both of the daughters, Sarah and Harriet, appear to have been well-educated for the period. They actually spent some time at least going to Miss Record Seminary, which is a ladies' seminary that was here in Geneva on South Main Street. And this is an engraving of the building. Uh, that's not the only school they went to. Uh, this is, again, according to their descendants' uh, genealogy. A boarding school in Canandaigua, which might have been the Ontario, Ontario Ladies Seminary, which was around at that time. And then he decided to send them to Albany, where I guess they had to take a canal boat on the last little leg to the academy, again, according to the genealogy. So they did have a ladies' education for the period. And if they went to Miss Record School, it was probably a pretty decent education from what we know of her. If you're interested in more about Mrs. Record, check out our blog. We have a, a, a couple of articles about her. Well, the country apparently was not the place for young ladies. Um, this is a story that I have heard ever since I came to work here, and I found it in the genealogy, and that was the source of that story. Um, Margaret Hillhouse said her mother and her aunt 
wanted to be closer to their friends and asked their father if they could move closer to town. And he decided to move from Maple Hill, sell that property and purchase this house at 543 South Main Street in 1842. It had been built in 1829 by Charles Butler. Uh, it was a very fine house. There were not as many houses along here at the time he bought it. It's a little hard to tell in this picture from 1836. Several of the houses along here are actually on the other side of the street. There's only a couple at this end of South Main Street. And you can see the terraced gardens, uh, of course, the steamboat on the lake. Um, and you can imagine it was quite lovely. You can see the outline of the house was very different at its original construction than by 1873, where it's drawn in this bird's eye view or how it looks today. And here's a picture I just recently found. I had never seen this before. This is from 1895. So this is just a couple of years after the Proudies moved out of the house, but it does show you the back of the house. And again, the terracing down to the railroad tracks that were put in later. There's a boathouse here. And we do know from the diaries that Phineas Prouty built a boat, uh, boathouse. So this may have been the one that he constructed. I don't know. I'd love to know, but I probably won't find out. I'm lucky I got this. I'm thinking this is the outhouse as well, in case you wanted to know. <laughs> so now here on South Main Street, we have a whole cast of characters. And I don't blame you if you get confused because they all <laughs> named everybody with the same names, just like the swans at Rose Hill. Uh, of the three children, we have Harriet. And again, I finally found, I had not looked before, but I finally found a picture of Harriet. It's a really terrible Xerox of a photo somebody in the family must have sent us the Xerox. We don't have an original. But this is Harriet, the oldest child, oldest daughter, living child, um, and her husband, Thomas Hillhouse. They married in December of 1844. And although Story of Geneva uh, by Emmons says they married at Maple Hill, they did not because he sold Maple Hill and moved here by 1844. So they must have married out of the parlor here. Then Gussie, we have no photos of Gussie as a young woman. Um, in fact, there's a photo of her in the scrapbook that says, this was the only photo of Aunt Gussie she ever had taken. Well, it's not true because I have two here, but they are from the same time period. Here she is quite elderly with her husband, Alex Chu, whose portrait I think hung, I'm not sure, we've changed some around. It may still be in the parlor here at the museum. Uh, here he is young, and here are another uh, photograph of them. He's very stern looking in all of his photographs. He doesn't look like he was a fun time, but uh, perhaps he was not conveyed well in his photographs, I don't know. Uh, so they married second. They were living here at this house briefly because they're recorded in the 1850 census as being residents here. But uh, the one who stayed here the longest was the son Phineas Jr. who got married a number of years after his sister in 1855 to Adelaide Cable, and here's a photograph of the two of them. They are featured very heavily in our scrapbook because it was their daughter's scrapbook. So it's very uh, hit or miss who's in the scrapbook and what photos we have because it was one daughter's photograph album and it's her friends and her view of her family that we have photo evidence of. Now, the daughters, of course, needed to live somewhere. Thomas Hillhouse was from Albany and he had a farm there, a quite successful farm. So Harriet actually moved off to Albany, uh, it was Water Valley, I believe, uh, where his house and farm were. She moved there with him and uh, they moved back because Phineas Sr. said, well, you know, I'd really like you here <laughs> and managed to convince his daughter and her husband that they should sell the farm and move back to Geneva and he would give them a plot of land to build their house on. And this is unfortunately not a terribly good photograph because we don't have one where you can really see the house. This is the house that Thomas Hillhouse designed and built, according to his daughter, in her genealogy, uh, at 755 South Main Street. It is still there. I think it's a dormitory for the colleges now. Um, I believe it was a fraternity house for a while. Uh, even in 1925, when Margaret Hillhouse wrote her genealogy of the family, it had been much altered. So it probably does not much resemble the house that Thomas Hillhouse designed. But they lived there for quite a number of years in that house. Uh, again, this shows the wealth that Phineas Prouty Sr. had. He also bought property down the street at 600 South Main Street, which is today a fraternity house at uh, just down the road from here. And that is where Sarah Gussie uh, and Alexander Lafayette, who her husband lived pretty much for their entire lives from 1849 or 50 until uh, their deaths in the early 20th century. 
Then Phineas, he stayed here with his father, who was the only other resident of the house, and his wife, Adelaide Cable, moved in here. We have perhaps the most interesting perspective on Adelaide and Phineas's life because they both wrote diaries. Phineas, just for a couple of years, a bit in 1858 and then a bit more in 1859. Adelaide seems to have kept a diary possibly from 1855 through the end of her life. Unfortunately, we don't have them all. We have diaries from 1855 to 1862, and then we have some from 1885 to 90, I believe. We know she wrote some in between because her daughter in the scrapbook wrote entries from the 60s and 70s from the diary, but we don't know what happened to those diaries. I'd love to see them. We have so much on this family, but of course, as a historian, you're always greedy for more. I'd love them. Along with the pages someone cut out of the diaries, we do have with all the juicy stuff that they didn't want us to know. So Phineas Jr. Uh, and Adelaide lived here in the house. Uh, Phineas called her Kit. If you want more about their personal life uh, and their trials and tribulations, I recently wrote a blog about them that you might find interesting that, where I go into greater detail. According to, again, Margaret Hillhouse, the house was outfitted with central heating, which we did know about in the 1850s and gaslight when it became available. She said Phineas Prouty Sr was interested in all sorts of innovations and inventions and immediately put those uh, innovations into his house. Um, Phineas Jr. and Alexander Chu then took over the hardware business from Phineas's father. And Phineas Sr. retired from the hardware business, but he had plenty of property and real estate that he kept busy with. So he continued to do some type of business transactions, but he apparently spent a lot of time here at home with Adelaide and the grandchildren, the two that two were, uh, Two were born before he passed away. So he knew his two oldest grandchildren uh, by his son very well. And of course, the cousins lived down the street, so they would frequently come over as well. Phineas Prouty Jr., as you'll know if you've read my blog, didn't really like the hardware business. Um, he liked drawing, and we have a, a sample of his work from the scrapbook here, and there were several other drawings as well. It wasn't bad. Um, he liked fishing and did comment about his father not enjoying fishing very much until he finally went and says, maybe he understands now. <laughs> uh, and then he, he gives a lot of quotes about how much he likes spending time. And he was about 28 when he married uh, Adelaide and she was 19, so they were relatively young, but he really enjoyed when they had their first couple of children hanging out at home with the wife and kids. Um, some of his descriptions of that experience sound a lot like what you would say today that you would not expect from the 1800s. Their first child, Millie, was born in 1856 and they had five more children over the next 20 years. Oops. Uh, Phineas Prouty Sr., of course, uh, did not live forever. He fell ill in 1862, which is right at the very end of Adelaide's diary that we have for that year as war broke out, um, as the war started, she sort of stopped her diary around 1862. And whenever she started again, we don't have the next set. Um, he seems to have died of a stroke. Uh, they called it apoplexy, which usually was a stroke. Fairly quickly, and she said without a great deal of suffering, um, he left behind an estate of about $60,000 in real estate and personal estate. I've looked up his will. He gave the Seneca Street property, the store and the aligned buildings. Uh, the South Main Street house, this house, uh, and all of its contents, carriages, horses, but he had a lot of stuff. There's a long list uh, to Phineas Jr. Then there was a property uh, business building he owned, two business buildings he owned on Exchange Street, which was called Water Street at the time, which he gave one to Sarah and one to Harriet, and they would remain in that family for quite some time. Then any funds from everything else he had would be divided among the three children in equal thirds, with those for Harriet and Sarah, of course, being left to their husbands to manage, because women didn't know how to manage money, nor did they have much legal right to do so if they were married. Uh, Phineas Prouty Jr., well, uh, he did not have the same ambitions as his father, as I've alluded to already. So one of the things they did, not immediately, but a few years after his father died, they divested themselves of the hardware store. It was sold to Underhill, Underhill and Bellows, remained a hardware store, and eventually it became Dorchester and Rose, owned by Oswald Rose, who was the son of Robert Selden Rose of Rose Hill, because all of these people are connected. Um, it remained in that location, but Prouty still owned the building, so they were getting rent from that hardware store as well. 
he started dabbling in all sorts of real estate and business investments, became a stockholder in a number of different endeavors, the Geneva Savings Bank he was involved with, the National Bank of Geneva when it became the National Bank of Geneva in, I believe it was 1867, uh, was involved with the Geneva Optical Company, the Waterworks, Phillips and Clark Stove Company, the Preserving Company. So he had a lot of income streams through what we would call today passive income and investment. He was a commissioner for the Glenwood Cemetery uh, creation. And he also worked, as I mentioned in my blog post, uh, as a school district trustee, which was not a job he loved according to his diary descriptions and a fire company member. And this is a, a, a image I use when I, when we had school programs, which I hope we will have again sometime, but I used to have first and second graders here every year in December, and I would talk a lot about the Prouty family. And this was a really good visual way to capture who they were and how they were connected on a way that we can all easily understand. So we have Phineas and Adelaide, and I talk about them a lot with kids because we know so much about their family life here. We have Phineas Sr. and Margaret, whose picture we don't have. And then Adelaide's parents were much younger than Phineas's parents, and they lived here in Geneva as well. Her father, um, whose first name is escaping me, but the last name was Cable. Uh, her father was a dancing master and would teach dancing throughout the region and travel around and have dancing lessons. I don't know if that's how Phineas and Adelaide met, but it's possible. And they lived quite a long time, much longer uh, than Phineas Sr. They were alive well into the late, uh, late 19th century. And then here are their five children. We have Millie who is written, Millie and Allie are written about a lot in the early diaries when they were first born and when they were babies and toddlers. Then we have Hattie here. This is the only identified photo we have of Hattie, unfortunately. Granty, whose actual name was Anna Madison, but she was born during one of Grant's campaigns in the Civil War and her nurse or babysitter nicknamed her Granty. So she was called that for her whole life. And Phineas, because we like to reuse names, <laughs> Phineas III. And of course, um, Phineas Jr.'s sisters, Harriet and Gussie, also had children named um, Harriet, Phineas, uh, Margaret. They kept, and, and Millie was actually Margaret Matilda. So they would come up with nicknames to help distinguish them. And it can be confusing sometimes to figure out who they're talking about. So this is one of only two family pictures we have, and they're all really tiny, which makes it hard to see them. We do get a nice view of the house. They made extensive alterations on the house while they lived here. Uh, they, it was originally, as you might recall from that drawing we looked at early on, uh, had a stepped gable on either side, and they changed the roof line to the Mansard roof line we have today added on uh, an addition over here, which was a bedroom, and then there was a porch on this side. There was what they called an oriel window, and that is written about in the diaries during the construction. Kit wanted an oriel window, and Finn said he would see what he could do about it, and he succeeded in putting it in. It is not there anymore because I believe when the Chews lived here in the 20th century, they put a refrigerator in there, a very large refrigerator, and then of course it was bricked up when it became a museum. They also redid the front porch um, from the federal style. You can see the double doors here. And if you have been to the museum before, you see those inside because when it was turned into a museum or sometime perhaps when the Chews uh, lived here in the 20th century, those doors were changed from front doors to interior doors and side panels for an entryway. This was removed and then the current um, uh, steps were put in much later. But this entryway has changed multiple times over the almost 200 years that this house has been here. And then we do have a number of people. I do a, have a close up so we can see them a little better. Uh, this is Phineas Jr. over here and Adelaide, as you can see, Hattie in the only identified photo we have of her. No idea who this is. It might be Hattie Chu. Uh, she was about the same age as Granty, so it might be her and she had dark hair. Here's Allie, their second daughter. Millie's way over here on the porch like a ghost, kids get freaked out by that, and Granty with her little uh, baby carriage. And this one we do have identifications on in the scrapbook, so we have several versions of this image. From the diaries, their time when the children were young in particular were filled with church services. They originally went to the Dutch Reformed Church. Phineas Sr. actually helped build that building. I assume that was the religion that his wife practiced. And uh, some of the children continued in that. Phineas 
went there and then sometimes went to Trinity across the street and even said at one point, as I believe I mentioned in my blog, that he preferred uh, the Episcopal services. And they seem to have shifted over to Trinity eventually. Uh, that's where the children were all baptized. They had birthday parties. They did go to school, not public school. They went to private schools, uh, ladies' schools or gentlemen's schools in the case of their son, who's not in this picture because he wasn't born yet. Uh, they had holiday celebrations. They visited uh, Adelaide's parents and Adelaide's parents came to visit them. They had a house called Rabbit Hill somewhere along the lakeshore at one point because they uh, write about visiting that in the scrapbook uh, quotations. And sometimes they mention in their diaries uh, national events, certainly the Civil War is covered quite a bit, uh, telegraphy and other things that happen and, and the amazing changes that were happening in the world were sometimes alluded to. And illness, boy, were people sick a lot in those days. If you read uh, diaries in which I talk at all about personal matters, illness comes up so often. Um, it seems like no one was ever healthy all the time in the family even with minor ailments, boils and all sorts of horrible things. And this is the second family picture that we have about 10 years, eight or 10 years later. And here we get a little bit better view of the stables, which in that rear view I showed earlier, you could actually just see the stables. They had a stable and carriage barn of some sort behind the house where probably this gallery that we're sitting in now is built. Um, we have also here, really tiny people who are a little bit blurry and a lot of unidentified, but I do have a close up where we can see Phineas Jr. and Adelaide again, a little bit older, their daughter's older. I believe this is Hattie. Uh, this is Franti, because you can tell from her face. This is Millie and this is Allie. And on her uh, lap is little Phineas III, who would have been about a year, year and a half at this point. And he's moving, so he's all blurry. I do not know who the other ladies are, probably could pin them down from the scrapbook, but I have not done that. So with all of these children, what were they doing? Well, when they were young, they had the birthday parties and schooling and the church services. As they got older, based especially on Anna's scrapbook, they, were ha they had a very active social life. Um, this was a well-to-do family. They did not have to work. Despite Mrs. Prouty's complaints about housekeeping in her early life as a housekeeper, Phineas's complaints about the hardware store, they did not, the girls did not have to work hard. Uh, certainly they went to school, they had servants, so they were not cooking um, as far as I can tell. They uh, were living a very different life, I suspect, from their mother or grandmother. And this is very similar to the story that we tell about Rose Hill and the change between Margaret Johnston, the immigrant from Scotland who salted down a hundred way to pork outside her house and Agnes Hutchins, uh, who traveled to Europe and um, had worth gowns. So we really do see this transition in wealthy families from sort of the New England uh, gentry, I guess we could say, to a much more, ostentatious is probably too strong a world, but, uh, but a little bit more obvious in terms of their wealth and their display of wealth. We know that the girls uh, spend a lot of time socializing with gentlemen from Hobart, not surprisingly, they live right down the street. This is Anna or Granty at a Hobart baseball game. And this is in her scrapbook. We have, again, a lot of photos of Anna because it was her scrapbook. Anna also liked to play tennis and she actually competed, I guess, in Rochester at least once. Here she is with a friend and some gentleman friends as well with their tennis rackets. This is a time in the 18, she was born in 1864. This is the 1880s, probably 18, late 1870s, early 1880s. Uh, she actually played uh, tennis at Fossen View, Elizabeth Smith Miller's camp on the other side of the lake. And that's where this picture was taken with a lot of her friends. Um, so she enjoyed outdoor life a bit. And this was a time when young ladies we're starting to try these things. This is Millie Prouty on what used to be the porch on the back of this building, and she is having tea. I uh, use this when I do the school program, taking tea to show what casual wear was like. And here we have Millie in a, she's got her sleeves rolled up. She's not wearing gloves. She does have a hat on because she's outside. Um, this lady is much more dressed up. I believe this is Alice Seward. And there's a blog post about her as well. Um, and a gentleman here having tea. They went on the carpet, the pillows, the chairs, everything. So not exactly what we would consider casual, but an enjoyment of the lake view in the back of the house. This is a terrific photo. I have no idea what they were doing when they took this. It's obviously behind the row houses somewhere along South Main Street. 
and uh, complete with outhouses that I'm sure made it a lovely place to sit. They have uh, all of their umbrellas to protect them from the sun. You didn't want to get a tan, of course. We have Grant T over here. We have Allie with this hat that says hands off on it for some reason. And we have Millie over here. So we have three of the Prouty girls in this photograph, along with many other denizens of South Main Street's young people, along with, of course, the requisite chaperones and stern looking lady here with the umbrella. Um, don't know what they were doing. I'd love to know the story behind this photo. Of course, young ladies do grow up and get married. And uh, that was certainly true for most of the Prouty children. Margaret Matilda, known as Millie, who was born in 1856, and we know so much about her as a toddler, I feel like I know this little kid. Um, she married uh, in 1884, Augustus Swift, who was a teacher. And this is where, this is actually not the beginning of their tragedy, as we'll, we'll see shortly. Um, she married Augustus Swift. Uh, they, I think, got married here at the house, according to the newspaper, and traveled for their European honeymoon. In Italy, Augustus got sick and died. Um, on the honeymoon and Millie came back. We do actually have her diary as a widow. I have not read it, but you don't have it transcribed. It'd be a great project to find out what was written in it. Hopefully something interesting and not just terrible, sorrowful things. But this is one of the pictures they had taken either just before or just after their marriage. Um, then we also do have other losses. Harriet Augusta, right, this is literally the same month that Millie gets married. And I am not certain that this is Hattie because I said we only have one identified picture of her, but this young lady is in um, her sister's scrapbook quite a bit. And she looks a lot like Phineas in one of the pictures. So I am guessing that this is the young Hattie um, Prouty. Hattie uh, apparently had a lovely voice, took singing lessons, sung in church and did a, a very nice, um, uh, song at her cousin's funeral because I think it was one of her two cousins who passed away and she sang at it. And the year later, um, at the time of Ron Millie's wedding, she went to New York City, um, Harriet Prouty Hill House and her husband had moved to New York City in the 1860s and she was probably visiting them. The girls had also gone to school in New York City and had friends there. Hattie went there and she became sick with some type of a digestive disorder and she died at, I believe, uh, yeah, she was just 22. So she, that was, and we have no diaries from that period, but we have them from the next year where they mark the losses that they had that March. And of course the family was extremely broken up by that. It was not the first loss, however, they did have a baby, which we know almost nothing about, Grace Beverly, uh, who was born in 1867 and died a year later. The only mention is in the photograph album. There is a quote from a diary we don't have where Adelaide uh, Phineas Jr. went, to, was heading to Kansas or somewhere out West, I've forgotten where. And he left and Adelaide telegraphed him, come home immediately, all the children sick. Grace is, is terribly, terribly ill and Grace died. I don't know what they were sick with, but presumably one of the many communicable diseases that they were constantly getting infected with. So they lost two of their children uh, young and, and before the parents passed away. Allie, their second daughter, got married in uh, 1887 to a doctor from Philadelphia and she moved to Philadelphia and they took this wonderful picture that's in, I believe the scrapbook as well or in our collection somewhere. It shows again that back porch, same place where they were having tea earlier. Uh, her older sister was having tea. This is, Adelaide, this is Adelaide here, young Adelaide Prouty, she's not so young anymore. Her mother is still alive at this point and Allie and then the, Allie's first child. And I believe, yes, uh, the Prouty's first grandchild, Phineas Prouty Christie. And Allie went on to have three children. Uh, so she did have a number of children and continued living in Philadelphia. I don't know much else about her remaining life. Um, Millie, Millie is always the interesting one. Uh, Millie got married a second time. Um, in 1889, she married Richard Davenport Harlan, and he was the son of a Supreme Court Justice, John Marshall Harlan, who was on the court at the time they got married. Uh, he was also a, um, I believe, valedictorian for Princeton. He was a minister. He was a minister in the Presbyterian Church, very apparently academic, well-written, uh, wrote eloquent letters to the editor, according to one source I looked at. So she did marry again. 
Um, they did not ever have any children, sadly. Perhaps, I, I have to wonder with all of the descriptions, Millie was terribly ill several times, including as a child when she nearly died. And I wonder if that didn't affect her fertility um, because she never did have children. Then we have Anna. So we've, we've gotten Millie married off and Allie married off. Um, then Hattie and Grace passed away. So of course they never married. Anna got married to a young man she met before her father died. And one thing she was always happy about was that he blessed their union. This is not the early picture. We have quite a few earlier ones. This happened to be the only one I had scanned on my computer, but this is her husband here, Kirkpatrick Bedal. And there's Anna in her later years. I do not know who these two are. They could be their children. Uh, they had a boy and a girl, so, but I'm not entirely sure. Um, Anna and uh, Pat, she called him Pat, he would come and visit. And there were a number of entries in the late diaries of Mrs. Prouty about Pat coming to visit and coming for Christmas. It sounds very happy, but as we'll see, it didn't turn out very happy because they eventually divorced, which was somewhat unheard of at that time. And then the last one, Phineas, and I should have an older picture of him. We don't have any much older than this because um, he was 16 when his father died and they moved out of town. So we only have, uh, I do have some teenage pictures of him, but again, I didn't have them scanned on my computer. So we have Phineas III. He married Francis Jerome, who is from Williamstown, Massachusetts, uh, also had children. What did they name them? Phineas Prouty. They seem to have had a Phineas Prouty in every single generation. They might be up to five or six now because they are on, I think, Ancestry or one of the other sites with their genealogy. Um, eventually ended up in California. And I'd be curious to know, you know um, I actually found an obituary for someone under other circumstances that was actually related to them. It was very strange. It's like, oh my gosh, it's a Prouty. Um, and then I seem to have passed over Phineas's death. I, he died in 1890, um, 1891, a year after Robert Swan. They're very parallel in their lifetime. And uh, he left half a million dollar estate. His father had 60,000. He parlayed that into a half a million dollars. And he left that money to his children, pretty much in equal parts, of course, again, except for his son who was under, uh, underage. It was left in trustee under uh, Adelaide's uh, executrix, as ex, 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 she, I believe, was the executrix, as well as Alexander Lafayette, too, uh, who was also, they were also um, in charge of the trusts for the daughters, because even though they were adults, they were not given any right over their own money. It was all left in trust. And Adelaide lived until about 1906. Adelaide and Granty and Phineas, who was just about 16 when his father died, moved to New York City. Uh, probably to be closer to their other family members that lived there. And that was when the family left the community and sold the, this house. Um, but it's not the end of the story because one great thing about the internet and the last 20 years of documents getting online is, boy, do you find out what happened to people when they left and you didn't have information in your archive. Um, Anna married Kirkpatrick, uh, Millie married Harlan, and uh, Allie married Christy, and they all moved off to different places. Mrs. Prouty did not have a long life, uh, sadly. Mr. Prouty died in his mid-60s. Mrs. Prouty was younger than him and did not live a whole lot longer. She lived about 10 years past her husband. She died in the early 20th century. Alexander Lafayette, too, died, I believe, 1911. So all of the sort of senior members who were um, in charge of the trust passed away. So the secondary ones were everybody's husband, because, of course, as we said, women can't be in charge of their own money. And so it was left to Richard Harlan, Walter Christie, and um, Anna's, Anna's husband was in charge of her money, not anybody else's. Each one of the husbands was in charge of their wife's trust. Um, unfortunately, some of them seem not to have been very good at managing money mm -hmm. and it came out eventually. Um, one issue was Millie didn't have any children. If Millie died with no children, her money went to her sisters. And as Millie was 50 without any children, they said, well, you know, what's been going on with your trust? We kind of were wondering what's in it because you're not gonna live forever. And um, no one would tell them. And so that's where we have, Air has asked for accounting. Uh, they wanted an account of what was going on with Millie's money. Well, what was going on with Millie's money was her husband, Richard Harlan, who was such a brilliant gentleman in so many ways. 
apparently was terrible with money and he had squandered it all in bad investments, pretty much depleted her entire estate, uh, which I guess if we divide it by 600, it was over a hundred thousand dollars, whatever it started at. Um, and he said to his brothers, hey, my sisters-in-law want to know what happened to the money. And uh, his brothers, also sons of Supreme Court justices, and one the father of the next John Marshall Harlan on the Supreme Court, they said, well, let's see. Well, I'll give you some money here to make up for that. They came up with a complicated scheme to hide the funding. And I can only follow it very briefly. It's in a story. It's in a biography of Justice Harlan, the second Justice Harlan. And uh, they apparently caused themselves more problems. The, the good thing was Anna's husband, who kept saying, hey, what's going on with the money? He'd also squandered all of Anna's trust. So they said that broke up their marriage. As you can see, they ended up getting divorced. Uh, it was probably one of many issues. Uh, Kirkpatrick had squandered the money. And so they said, well, you lost your wife's money. So you can't ask about my wife's money. Um, so essentially there were legal actions, which explains why when I first went to find information on the Proudies 15 years ago at Ontario County Records and Archives, there were six boxes of records for Prentice Prouty Jr. And I was like, I don't know what all this is about. Is this court stuff? I've never gone back and looked at it again, but it had to be all the court papers involved in this. Um, because then there was also an issue about the Prouty building, uh, which they had the heirs after Phineas Jr. died, decided to knock it down and build the building that is there today. And they took a loss when they did it and they sold some stock and they took a loss. And there was questions about who had made the decisions and the, were they the best decisions? So there was quite a bit in the newspaper. Um, with digitization, I found an awful lot about the discord between Anna Grantee and her husband. They got, she was suing him. He ran off to Nevada, tried to get a divorce there. It was just, it was all over the social pages. And I guess it just shows you that perhaps more money did not do the family any good as it does with so many families. Um, money can provide you with some advantages but it can also lead to a lot of discord. And in fact, in the biography of Justice Harlan, it says that this issue about Margaret Harlan's trust completely destroyed the relationship between the three brothers who were the son of the Supreme Court justice and the father of the other Supreme Court justice. It was a, a vicious, vicious family argument that all started with the property money um, and then moved through all sorts of other issues that that family had. So that's what I've got so far. I hope to get a little bit more into some of these issues with the daughters when I write my blog report, uh, blog paper, um, blog paper, blog article on it. So there will be more before the end of the year. I don't know if anyone has any questions either here in the room or if you have questions in the virtual version, uh, you can go ahead and type them into the chat. I will see if I can get it to pop up so I can see them. Um, any questions? Zoom, I'm trying to pull up chat in case there's anything there. Okay, we don't have any questions from what I have been reported on. So I want to thank everybody for joining us today. And uh, it was very strange to see my face behind there. <laughs> um, I want to thank you all to, for joining us today. I hope you enjoyed the story of the Proudies. And this is just sort of a window into the kinds of work that we do here at the museum. Oh, I do have a chat question. Hold on. Oh, it's a compliment. Thank you very much. <laughs> um, I want to welcome everybody to come here, see the house. Uh, imagine what it was like when they lived here and moving through these rooms. And um, at some point, maybe we'll, we'll get more of the transcriptions online. But if you're interested in more, feel free to read the blog posts. And I do have one more I'm going to write. So hopefully I'll continue the story later. Thank you all for attending virtually and in person. Mm -hmm. And you can always email me here at the museum if you think of something you want to know later. Thanks so much. Bye.